Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program with financial and economic experts Jared Bernstein, David Stiegel, and Sarah Bloom Raskin, moderated by Richard Bard on the topic Emerging from Economic Catastrophe and Charting a Course Forward. I'm Chris Sable, the Vail Symposium Executive Director. On behalf of Vail Mosier, our board chair, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. The Vail Symposium got its start in 1971 and shortly thereafter developed the motto, Convening Locally, Thinking Globally. This has served us well for almost 50 years. While we cannot be together tonight in the incomparable Vail, Colorado, we are so grateful you've decided to convene with us online tonight. Some program notes before we get started. At the bottom of the screen, you should see an option for Q&A. That is how you will communicate with the speakers tonight. I will monitor the Q&A and share your questions at the end. Please help me out by keeping them as concise as possible. The program will run seven hours and 15 minutes. It is being recorded, and the video will be available on the Vail Symposium website in a few days. Our sponsors are the Town of Vail, the Vail Daily, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, and the Antlers at Vail. Our virtual programs are underwritten by Alpine Bank and supported by a grant from the Colorado Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the CARES Act. The summer season is underwritten by Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher, and tonight's program is underwritten by Sandy and Fred Pack. The Vail Symposium is supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Please plan to join us next Thursday, August 27th, when Professor Matthew Johnson of the John Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research will be joined by Kevin Matthews, Executive Director of the Society for Psychedelic Outreach, Reform, and Education to discuss the ongoing research, legal status, and real-world applications of psilocybin. We hope you've been enjoying these online programs. We have nine more programs scheduled between now and the end of October. Tonight's program features a wealth of expertise from the world of finance and the economy. To get things started, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Richard Bard. Richard is the founder and chief executive officer of Bard Capital Group, LLC, a middle market private equity firm with a diversified portfolio. He's been involved in the acquisition and operation of several private and publicly traded businesses over the past 30 years. He previously served as chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. He serves on our advisory council and is instrumental in helping us develop these financial programs. Good evening, Richard. Turn my mute off. Thank you, Chris. Can everybody hear me? Good. Well, welcome to the, uh, this financial series event. Uh, many of you would, would know that we typically have financial series events late fall and, and through the spring. Uh, this is a very special event in lots of ways. A few months ago, in the middle of the pandemic, we thought, what a, what a great, great idea to have an economic event and look at the economy, you know, perhaps in late summer, early fall, and there'll be so much going on. And it was very um, questionable about what that might look like, whether it would be a a V-curve recovery or a U-curve recovery or no recovery at all. So uh, we began to look for, for a great expert um, list of, of, of uh, speakers and panelists to, to help us think this through. Um, and I think you'll be very excited about um, hearing what they have to say tonight. So uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have, I'll introduce each speaker and uh, I'll give you even though the bios were up, I'll give you a short uh, read of their bio and then the speakers will begin to uh, spend probably 10, 10 to 15 minutes uh, with their prepared remarks and then we'll have some Q&A among us and then we'll open it up to the audience. So the first speaker is Sarah Bloom Rankin, Ruskin rather. Uh, she was formerly a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System about five years after I retired and uh, a former United States Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. She became a visiting professor of the practice of law, a distinguished fellow of, Luke, of Duke Law School's Global Financial Market Center, and a senior fellow of the Duke Center on Risk in 2020. After serving as a Rubenstein Fellow at that university, 
of course, David Rubenstein has been with us before. Uh, Sarah had a leadership role in the G7, helping forge a consensus regarding cybersecurity in the financial sector, and recently testified before the Senate on the financial stability implications of climate change. So without further ado, Sarah, take over. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Richard, and I'm happy to be joining this evening's Vail Symposium um, and looking forward to our discussions. Um, also very pleased to be sharing, uh, sharing time with Jared Bernstein and David Siegel. So um, it's been an extraordinary year. Um, our sense of time and place are distorted and confused and anguished by the confluence um, of events, um, events that really were catalyzed by a never experienced um, once in a lifetime, perhaps pandemic. So the pandemic, the pandemic as a health crisis, um, the pandemic as an economic crisis, and really the recognition of uh, widespread anti-black racism as embedded within our economic uh, institutions really all converged um, and became concentrated within the expanse of um, mere months. And this extraordinary confluence has led to really a combination of um, uh, stasis and chaos uh, where we've been cast out of our usual routines and our normal escape routes. But it's really also been an opportunity to gain some control um, and some understanding. And from an economic perspective, we really may have no idea of what the economy will look like in the next five years, let alone the next five months. But at least we now know um, where we've been and who we are. Um, so um, before I kind of move too much into this existential, <laughs> sort of existentialist kind of sense as to what it's like to be living um, in these times with these, you know, with this confluence of, of, of major change um, around us, um, what I want to, of course, talk about tonight and uh, why we're here tonight is really to, to discuss, you know, the economy, uh, what it looks like now, um, what it might look like later, and challenges ahead for policymaking. So I want to start really with the current state of the economy and venture some reasons why I'm not surprised by the slow recovery that we're experiencing. Um, and explain really where our economic policy settings are right now. And finally, describe some policy actions, actions in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term that could enhance our ability to recover. So let me just start very briefly with, with the current state. Um, and I know uh, Jared's gonna get into probably more detail on this, but the current sta state as I see it is really quite fragile. So we are experiencing in the US very slow growth. Um, we have significant job loss. Many of those job losses have become permanent. More than 20 million people are looking for jobs. And the current estimate of the number of jobs available is something far less than the number of people who are, who are searching now. Bankruptcies are soaring, and we're seeing a recovery uh, in the business sector, but one that is uneven. Some firms recovering more quickly uh, than others. Now, this is to me not particularly surprising. Um, for one thing, the economy is not an on-off switch that um, uh, can be turned on and off and be expected to uh, surge back into full capacity uh, at a moment's notice. Um, 
In addition, you know, the factors that determine economic resilience or determine, you know, if you think of economic resilience as this concept of bounce back, right? An economy that's been shocked, how long does it take the economy to, to bounce back, to resume uh, its normal trajectory? If you look at the factors that constitute resilience, I mean, you look at how, sort of what they looked like pre-pandemic, I think you could conclude that they were not factors that were conducive to a quick bounce back. Now, why do I say that? There are a number of, a number of factors that you can look at to determine what would constitute the context for a quick bounce back. Um, but a couple. Um, first of all, prior to the pandemic, uh, there has been greater heterogeneity in income and wealth. Um, this is the notion, again, of, um, of, of middle class being hollowed out. Um, it turns out that this kind of dispersion in wealth and income is relevant to the ability of an economy to get traction after it's shocked. So the heterogeneity we know pre-pandemic was one that was quite dispersed and one that was, um, I, I believe, relevant to our ability to uh, come back after any kind of shock. Um, similarly, pre-crisis, we, um, we were aware of, of a number of inequities. Um, I'll talk about one in particular, inequities in educational outcomes, educational systems, right? Now, why, you know, why might, you, know, you might say, why should that be relevant to how an economy uh, bounces back? It turns out uh, one of the things that the economy is struggling with right now is um, the reopening of schools and whether uh, people are choosing to put their children back uh, into school, um, whether schools themselves are opening um, and how learning is going to occur in this uh, pandemic induced uh, uh, society. Um, another factor that I would say is relevant to uh, the ability of, a, of an economy to bounce back, opportunities for mobility. What, does an, you know, what are the opportunities for moving in between income levels and moving um, from social class to social class? And it turns out in the US, those opportunities were becoming more limited pre-pandemic. Um, similarly, I would argue that we were ill-prepared um, from a public sector perspective for a shock of this kind. We had underinvested in various ways um, that could have enhanced our ability to bounce back more quickly. And um, finally, I would argue that we have a weakened public infrastructure so that the infrastructure uh, that um, exists, and you can think of that infrastructure as, as, as simple as being, you know, the state of our IT system, um, of our particular delivery mechanisms, um, I would argue uh, were and have been quite weakened pre-pandemic. And these kinds of factors uh, are relevant to how quickly we can bounce back um, post-shock. Uh, post um, in addition, uh, supply chains, a lot of supply chains um, were very much just-in-time supply chains. And supply chains that we um, have now learned could have been stronger, and had they been stronger uh, in particular, could have um, enhanced our ability to bounce back. High business uncertainty, so a lot of uncertainty. Even pre-pandemic, we were seeing a um, almost a secular decline in business investment. And uh, that, um, uh, that inability to um, have the conditions that permitted strong business investment worse is something that um, arguably affects our ability today to bounce back. So, um, so for these reasons, um, I'm not particularly surprised by our, um, our inability to, uh, to bounce back more quickly. Um, and, and probably of paramount um, importance is this notion that we are not going to have a full economic recovery until we have a recovery from the pandemic. So the health crisis and the economic crisis are inextricably linked. 
And until we have a plan in this country that goes to the heart of the, you know, of getting ahead of the pandemic, I, um, I am not going to be surprised to be seeing subpar economic growth. Now, how have policymakers responded? So there are a number of economic policy making tools. Um, there are fiscal tools, there are monetary policy tools, financial regulatory tools, there are international economic tools, and there are oversight tools. So this is the toolbox that, that um, economic policymakers have. And briefly, you, you know, we'll know what they are. You know, fiscal policy, of course, is the spending that is authorized by Congress. And um, we know uh, in this case that the spending in the CARES Act uh, in particular was massive, was quite significant, um, and was intended really to bring about a, um, a strong fiscal uh, push to, to restart the economy. Monetary policy. Monetary policy is also a strong set of economic tools when they are used in full deploy, deployable mode, and that's what they are at right now. Uh, you see the, you know, the Fed funds rate uh, set at zero. You see quantitative easing um, used to its maximum capacity. Uh, you see uh, new tools being launched uh, through uh, these emergency lending facilities, so the so-called 13-3 facilities, um, have been set up um, and are, um, are, are in full, uh, most of them are in full uh, deployable mode. So monetary policy tools are another set of, uh, of tools and uh, are used by the Fed and in this case have been turned on full blast. Um, financial regulatory tools. So you will, you know, remember in the midst of this debate discussions about capital buffers, about uh, whether whether financial firms should be uh, paying dividends right now. These decisions regarding capital um, and regarding leverage are are tools that um, the uh, the financial regulators deploy and have made decisions about as well international economic tools, I want to mention them uh, as well. Those are tools regarding uh, sanctions, for example. They are part of the economic policy tool making kit. We have seen uh, the use of those tools, sanctions and so forth, being used now. Query as to whether they are being used as, um, as a mechanism to deal with the current economic environment or whether they are being used in a, in a different way. Um, and then finally, oversight tools. And these are the tools that um, need to be established by law, but uh, have been established in this case and have to do with the fact of overseeing how the, um, how the deployment of the, um, uh, of, of the, of the economic policy making uh, response has been going. And so my contention is, you know, that the tools, um, you know, that we, you know, all these tools, I would say, have not been deployed in a particularly disciplined and coordinated manner, um, either domestically or internationally with our international counterparts. We have seen the tools all being used, uh, some more effective than others. We have seen, for example, uh, the CARES Act do a very significant push in terms of fiscal spending. Um, at the same time, many of those tools expired in, on July 31st. And there has not been a, uh, a fiscal uh, follow-up to the use of those tools that um, you know, I would argue is uh, necessary uh, right now. Um, monetary policy tools, um, I would say, have been deployed in a very creative um, and full powered, full blast kind of way, but they are directed towards different parts of the economy, namely markets and market functioning. And we have not seen those tools necessarily correspond to um, results regarding employment um, and some of the more targeted things that you, know, you would like to see as having be, rep, you know, be representative of a recovering economy. So I think what, you know, the results that we are going to have is we are going to have an uneven recovery um, with some sectors recovering faster than others. 
we are going to, I think, be um, losing some oversight and accountability, um, which I believe, again, is important because you don't want your, um, you know, your money being siphoned off in terms of fraud so, or corruptive uses. So the oversight mechanisms, I think, are important and have not been, um, I would argue, uh, uh, being correctly deployed. Um, and finally, I think that there are opportunities to be combining our spending with, um, with um, opportunities for greater returns on the investment. And um, those opportunities, I would say, have not been, uh, have not been seized. And in particular, I'm thinking of, um, of, of the creation of, of green and clean jobs. And, thinking about whether the spending can be better connected to outcomes that are more sustainable. So I said um, earlier um, that, you know, this is a kind of disorienting time. Uh, these months have been um, uh, somewhat, you know, disturbing, but at the same time, we've been given an opportunity to gain some control and some understanding. And I think we understand now that there are and there will be consequences that need to be assessed. And let me talk a little bit about those consequences. When I think about them, I put them in buckets. I think about them as short-term and medium-term and long-term. And I um, uh, don't suggest, uh, I don't think about that in terms of priority, but I think of that, you know, that they can all be handled at the same time, but some are going to take longer than others. So for example, um, and I'll give a couple of examples before I stop, um, on the sort of different kinds of policy responses you might imagine um, that could deal with some of the longer term consequences that we're going to be facing. From a short term perspective, right? I mean, we have cut off economic, crucial economic support to households and businesses. So the CARES Act was I would argue a very effective um, first response, but there has been no follow-up response. Um, as many of you know, the House passed the so-called HEROES Act. There has been no corresponding Senate bill to the House bill, um, and hence no follow-up to the CARES Act. Now, there have been these executive orders that have come out um, from the president. Um, we can talk about them later. I, you know, My own view is that they, um, are not, um, they're not much, they're pretty illusory, they're pretty ephemeral, meager. Uh, they address, you know, I think they, they, they try to address um, you know, student loan debt, they try to address housing debt, they try to address the unemployment side, um, they attempt to do something with payroll taxes. Um, I don't think that they are um, gonna do the trick here. So we, as a short term, matter as an immediate matter, I think we have to figure out how to restore and improve economic support. And I think that is a critical short-term um, set of steps that has to be uh, taken on. Um, ancillary to that point is the delivery of that assistance. You know, we talked a little bit about how Fed delivery is quite quick. Um, fiscal delivery that has to go through, say, the Small Business Administration, or is dependent on the writing of checks, that takes a while. We've got to look at those um, implementation devices and make sure that they are up to speed. And we learned, by the way, during the CARES Act that they were not, that there were quite a number of speed bumps that were uh, being encountered. Medium term. Medium term, we've got, to, we've got to figure out how to get more traction to this economic uh, recovery. And I think one Thing to think about there is, is, is investing really in delivery mechanisms that could be quicker, okay? So it's not just the writing of checks and depositing them in bank accounts and many people don't have bank accounts and they having to, they're having to wait. Or unemployment checks coming from a state that hasn't kept its IT systems up to, up to date. So the, the delivery mechanisms, I think we need to think more imaginatively about that. Um, there's something called, for example, real-time payment that the Fed might be able to do, real-time payment methods. Let's think about that. Let's, let's, let's take that on as, um, as a possible way of delivering assistance quicker. Um, 
then I think we want to give some thought really to how to adjust these different, um, the different settings that, that I talked about, right? So we have here the Fed moving quite quickly. We have the fiscal assistance coming in quite slowly. We've got um, a kind of mixed message on the federal, uh, on the financial regulatory front. How are these tools all fitting together? And I would try to look at that and coordinate them. And I think we would do it not just domestically, but we would talk to our international counterparts to try and do the same thing. Finally, um, on the long term, um, optimally, we would be building back sustainably. That means that we need to be prepared really for the next risk coming our way. Optimally, you don't wait for you know, the house of straw to be blown down before you build a new one. You attempt to build stronger initially. And um, that is one piece and one kind of perspective that I would argue is, um, is lacking now, but one that um, from a longer term perspective, I think we could be very um, imaginative and bold about, which is essentially how to think ahead of risk and, 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 and you know, to be clear that risk is climate. Um, what are we doing to prepare for a transition um, where the future will not be able to be as dependent on carbon as it has been in the past. Um, similarly, how are we thinking about public infrastructure? Is, is, you know, how are we thinking about public infrastructure? Is this a good moment to be investing in more sustainable public infrastructure um, you know, features? Uh, because interest rates are so low and you can actually do something um, a little bit more affordably now. So these are the kinds of, of, of ideas I would, um, I would urge us to think about um, from a longer term perspective. And, um, and I, will, I will stop there, um, but looking forward to the discussion to come. All right, thank you, Sarah. Good, uh, good comments and we'll come back and ask you some questions about all those uh, thoughts later on. Let me introduce Jared Bernstein. So Jared joined the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities as a senior fellow in May of 2011. From 2009 to 2011, notably, uh, he was the chief economist and economic advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, executive director of the White House Task Force on the Middle Class, and member of President Obama's economic team. Uh, Bernstein has published extensively in various venues and is a commentator on the cable station CNBC and is a contributor to the Washington Post's Post Everything blog. Jared. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks for the invitation. A pleasure to be here with you, Richard, and uh, my old friend, Sarah, and uh, good to see David as well. Uh, Sarah covered a lot of ground, and uh, I want to try to not cover sa the same ground, so maybe I can try to cut some corners and be a little, a brief, uh, uh, if, uh, a little briefer than my than my allotted time if I can. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, is to talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of the pre-pandemic economy and focus um, uh, on the, not the, I was going to talk about the policy response, but I thought Sarah just covered every uh, corner of that really effectively. So instead of talking about the policy response, which you've just uh, heard about, I'd like to talk about um, the, some of the uh, policy architecture that I think is likely to be missing in the economy on the other side of the crisis, which relates to my list of weaknesses when I talk about the pre-pandemic strengths and weaknesses of the economy. The weakness list is actually a lot longer. That's not because uh, uh, there weren't uh, some strengths uh, or because I'm just a a dark and sour economist like so many of our trade. Uh, it's because I think that the uh, weaknesses of the pre-pandemic economy um, are setting the groundwork for uh, what's missing on the other side. The strengths of the pre-pandemic economy were pretty evident. Unemployment was very low. I blame Sarah for some of that uh, and her team at the Federal Reserve, who I thought did a, a uniquely 
good job at being very data driven versus um, uh, uh, kind of theory driven in terms of uh, how they wielded monetary policy. Uh, and they allowed the unemployment rate to fall to levels that had um, heretofore thought to be uh, dangerous in terms of tempting uh, spiraling inflationary pressures. Not only did those pressures uh, not uh, appear, but in fact, uh, inflation has been very low for very long. So unemployment hit three and a half percent. Now, uh, those of us who've been following these sorts of things for a long time know that years ago, economists thought the lowest the unemployment rate could go without triggering inflationary pressures was 6%, and then they thought it was 5%, and then they thought it was 4%. And now, if they're being honest, if we're being honest, we don't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, that is kind of an insight that I thought was helping to drive um, uh, important advances in, in not just monetary policy, but in the very low unemployment rate and the long expansion uh, that accommodated that low rate. And it's not just that the number three, five is, is a number that, uh, you know, is historically low and I like that. It's the impact that it has, particularly on people who've been left behind. I thought Sarah made a lot of important comments about racial inequities that are embedded in our economy and that have broken out in recent uh, months in ways that uh, we, we simply uh, can't and, and mustn't and shouldn't ignore. Um, and one of the upsides of, having, uh, uh, of driving a, a really persistently tight labor market as you start pulling folks in from the sidelines. This is good microeconomics because it provides opportunities for people who otherwise would be left behind. Uh, but it's also good macroeconomics because it increases the economy's quote supply side, uh, meaning that uh, there's more uh, people working and contributing uh, to economic growth. So I consider that to be some of the, the those issues to be some of the, the most um, positive strengths of the pre-pandemic economy. I mentioned low inflation. In, 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 in a way, that's a strength, but it's also a weakness, and I'll come back to that. Um, it's not just that inflation has been low, it's that it's been consistently below even the Fed's pretty low target of 2%. So they've been missing to the downside for a long time. That's useful uh, in terms of driving faster real uh, growth for uh, people with uh, perhaps uh, low wage levels, but it's also a sign of, of, of weak demand. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, I, also, I also think one strength, um, and I'd be interested in Richard and David's uh, view about this, I think one strength in the economy before the, uh, the crisis was in fact that the financial sector looked to me somewhat less bubbly. I don't mean that it was, uh, um, uh, I'm not saying that it wasn't leveraged or that there weren't problems or that there weren't speculation because there was, and perhaps uh, we can talk about some overborrowing and aspects of the corporate sector. Uh, but the fact uh, uh, from, uh, my, uh, is, from my perspective is that uh, I didn't see any systemic uh, credit bubbles of the type that have gotten us in trouble before. And when I look at the numbers, it looked like a lot of institutions were pretty well capitalized. And uh, another way of saying that as someone who was in the Obama administration is it looked to me like some of the attributes of, uh, some of the components, I should say, of, uh, of Dodd-Frank financial reform uh, seem to be uh, working in ways that, that we'd hope. I don't want to push this too far because it's complicated and uh, uh, it has, uh, the, there are aspects of Dodd-Frank that haven't been tested. But I think it's fair to say that we certainly haven't seen credit bubbles of the type that uh, kind of brought down the last two recoveries. Okay, turning to the weaknesses pre-pandemic. Inequality was very high, Sarah talked about that. Uh, dispersion of income, wealth, wages, um, that's uh, probably the biggest uh, weakness and problem in the economy pre-pandemic. Uh, it, it's a problem both in terms of uh, kind of a sustainable um, democracy that people believe in if productivity is, is consistently going up and uh, middle and lower income people are consistently falling up, uh, behind. Um, there's a kind of injustice embedded in that. And uh, in my view, it, it provides an entree for all kinds of uh, um, uh, politics, some of which can get, get pretty ugly and pretty authoritarian. Um, and, and, and I think that that's been borne out. Um, racial inequities have been discussed and were, of course, uh, a very serious problem in the pre-pandemic economy. Segregation of housing, the wealth disparity between black and whites is, uh, 
is uh, far greater than the overall average, and of course, police violence. Now, I mentioned um, wage growth, uh, which was helped a little bit towards the end of the expansion by very low inflation. But if you kind of look over the broader period, uh, wage growth for, for the middle class is very, pretty stagnant for a while. Um, income uh, for the median household um, grew. Uh, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't stagnate. It didn't stagnate, but it, it continued to generally fall behind overall economic growth, which is kind of another way of saying inequality kept growing over this period. Poverty came down, but perhaps not as much as we would have liked. The quality of many jobs uh, was, I think, a weakness. We, we, we did very, very, very well on job quantity, as I mentioned, but on job quality, there were shortcomings, particularly in the area of the absence of paid leave, uh, inadequate health coverage, um, uh, pensions, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, wage trends. Um, now, I mentioned low inflation is kind of a, 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 a positive attribute of the economy's strength because it allowed the Fed to go to places they haven't gone before. But it's also symptomatic of this problem that economists call secular stagnation, meaning weak demand, even in a long and you know, somewhat uh, uh, durable expansion that, you know, that the expansion that ended with the crisis was, was one of the longest on record. I think it was the longest on record. So uh, one reason, you know, that occurred was because um, uh, inflation never, you know, spiraled out of control, but it was also very low and pretty insensitive to demand and interest rates were also very low. And that can, that can be a symptom of other problems in the economy, particularly weaker aggregate demand than you might expect or hope for in an economy that's churning along at such low unemployment. So I do think there is this thing that economists were kind of scratching their heads about as to why um, even at low unemployment, there was a, a, a sense of, of, of stagnation uh, in lots of the variables that I was just citing, like in middle-class incomes. And I think one of the answers in, is inequality itself. Inequality is both problematic in the sense of not um, uh, providing people with just rewards, but also if the broad middle class doesn't have much buying power, we're a 70% consumer spending economy. So that is going to uh, be a constraint on growth as well. Um, uh, Sarah talked about infrastructure as, as a weakness. I won't go there. Uh, she also talked about climate. Um, the one thing that nobody's mentioned so far, which is kind of interesting to me, uh, which uh, I think probably was a weakness of the, uh, of the economy in a way, was the extent of fiscal imbalances. Um, so the uh, deficit was very high before we went into this recession, and it was rising, which is something you don't usually see. Typically, when uh, the economy is moving towards full capacity as we were, uh, the um, income growth spins off enough revenues to start to take down uh, the deficit as a, <clears throat> as a share of the economy. Instead, it was going up. Why? Um, because the Trump tax cuts broke the linkage between overall economic growth and revenue flows to the treasury. So here's an interesting fact. Every time we've entered a recession over the last 50 years, the debt to GDP ratio, that is public debt as a share of the economy, has been in the range of 35 to 40%. This time it was twice that. So we went into this recession with a debt to GDP ratio that was well north of 70%. Now, I am actually a pretty dovish person when it comes to uh, budget deficits. I certainly don't uh, worry that um, budget deficits are going to create all kinds of havoc and raise interest rates. But there are a number of reasons why I think deficits matter. In the interest of time, I won't go into them, but if Richard wants to draw them out in discussion, I'll be happy to do so. So once the uh, pandemic hit, we had entered this crisis, I believe that all of these weaknesses were really very strongly amplified. Uh, by, uh, by the crisis, by the pandemic. Um, in a way, this is kind of what I heard Sarah getting at in, you know, not that she, I don't think Sarah was saying there's a silver lining, <laughs> okay? So I don't want to conflate that, but that there are things we've discovered about, you know, ourselves and our policy uh, that the uh, pandemic is going to pull back the curtain. Um, not just inequality, but the inter intersection between inequality and racial disparities. A healthcare system that when everybody's, uh, when, when working age people, your healthcare is tied to work, 
and 30 million people lose jobs, that's going to be a problem, especially relative to other advanced economies where healthcare isn't so tightly linked to work. So there's a fragility of our healthcare system. There's a real fragility of our unemployment insurance system. Trust me, I've been in government for more recessions than I want to remember. And every time we hit a damn recession, we have to reinvent our unemployment insurance system. And that is just bat crazy in terms of, in terms of policy. Um, we're seeing a conspicuous missing market in, uh, in the current economy that was there. It was a weakness, uh, but we, we see it now. The absence of a child care uh, sector. We just don't have a functioning, affordable sector where working people can safely and even productively um, leave their children. And, and that's a, a missing market that, uh, that uh, we need to correct. So in closing, let me say that every one of those structural weaknesses uh, that were embedded in uh, the pre-crisis economy, it's somewhat papered over by uh, a very favorable macro outlook um, were uh, laid bare uh, in the crisis. And th the policy agenda seems clear to me. It has to do with um, public investment in clean energy and offsetting environmental degradation. I think there's an industrial policy agenda in terms of our manufacturers and setting up a childcare sector. Uh, I think there's a need to Onshore, onshore some supply chains that uh, I believe Sarah mentioned that uh, are kind of missing in action and, and very uh, vulnerable. And uh, uh, th there's a racial equity agenda uh, that um, uh, means a, a policy architecture, architecture having to do with both, uh, I think, aggressive monetary policy of the type we've talked about before, but also fiscal policy in education and training and job creation for uh, people who've been uh, left behind. Uh, there's a uh, investment agenda in manufacturing, in innovation, in, um, uh, in uh, I mentioned clean energy, but in, in, in aspects of clean energy like uh, uh, renewables and battery technology and uh, solar and energy storage. These are all sectors that uh, are out there waiting to um, I think be essentially claimed by a, uh, uh, a public-private partnership that's smart enough to make the kind of investment plays we need to capture market share in areas that are both uh, critical for um, uh, a, a clean energy economy, but also providing much needed jobs on the other side of the crisis. I'll stop there, uh, but uh, thank you uh, for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. Very interesting. I, I'm uh, I'm intrigued actually by the all the notions of the sort of the weaknesses of, of our society society being sort of laid bare by by this uh, pandemic. And I think I want to come back and talk about that. Uh, let me introduce David Siegel. Uh, he's an entrepreneur who has started many companies. I think I saw number 25, but I'll, I'll believe 12. Uh, He's written five books on technology and business. Uh, he was once a candidate to be the, the dean of the Stanford Business School. Um, he writes and speaks often on a bunch of subjects, including the blockchain, decentralization, startups, business, economics. Uh, but he's generally a critical thinker. And uh, I met David, I guess, a few months ago. And uh, I see him more as, a, as a, not only as a critical thinker, but as a futurist. So I wanted to take sort of uh, our economic discussion and, and let David sort of, you know, do the cleanup act and tell us where we're going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'm going to share my screen and it's not going to be ideal because uh, you're going to see my, my notes. So I'm going to ask people to just look at the screen area and let me read my notes and navigate because I, I can't set it up better than that. Is that okay? Can we, I don't know if you see, is that, is that good enough? Uh, thanks to Richard and to Chris and the Vail Institute for inviting me to speak today with these other people who know more about economics than I do. My name is David Siegel and I'm a professional heretic. Uh, so today you'll hear about 10 minutes of heretical, one heretical idea that I hope will stimulate conversation. I do have a connection to Vail. This is my family's very first home on Lions Ridge Loop Road that we bought in 1973. 
I believe that long run economic growth solves many of the world's problems. You see my screen okay, everybody? I don't know if it's okay. All right. Uh, poverty, yep. education, literacy, democracy, health, mortality, lifespan, all these things have improved dramatically over the past 40 years. The two big drivers are innovation and monetary policy. Today, I'll take a few minutes to review monetary policy in the past and present, and then I'll present, spend most of the time describing a new approach that will not just help get us out of our current situation, but will create long-term growth for the future. So I'm gonna show some graphs, but just, just hang with me and just get the general gist. Economists generally assume that GDP is a good driver of quality of life. So if we can maximize the long run growth of GDP, we could probably help the most people, but periodically we have recessions, shown here in gray. When there is a recession, many people lose jobs, but poor people are hurt the most. I claim that almost all of these recessions were actually the result of bad monetary policy. In the past, when there have been shocks to the economy, the Fed was always too worried about inflation. So they did what I call too much too late. Overall, monetary policy has made most shocks worse, not better. And the Great Recession was no exception. The standard story is that in 2008, the recession was caused by a glut of housing, subprime, too many subprime loans, over leverage, and bad incentives. And I don't believe the data shows that to be true. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but in the first half of 2008, jobs were down and prices were up. By August, though, it was possible to see that economic growth had turned sharply south. And by September, both unemployment and growth were going in the wrong direction. There was an election coming up, uncertainty was very high, and that's exactly when the Fed did nothing. Fearing inflation, they inadvertently put the brakes on the economy when they should have been printing money, stepping on the gas pedal, and stimulating growth. Now that fall, the European Central Bank actually raised the interest rates and the whole in the worldwide economy never recovered. This all happened, not because of housing or banking, but mostly because money was too tight. With better monetary policy, I believe we probably wouldn't have had a recession at all. How's that for heretical? This year, we've seen a severe shock and the government has responded with fiscal payments to individuals and businesses, as well as some quantitative easing. Now, history has shown that fiscal payments are short-lived and ineffective. They increase debt and don't increase the velocity of money in the economy. Yeah, sure, you need to address the immediate needs of hospitals, medical personnel, police, uh, critical workers, probably the unemployed, but the creation of new money benefits more people in the short run and in the long run. So far, the Fed has printed $1.4 trillion in new money. Now, now as, as Jared said, you know, that's, that's, that might not be creating as much inflation as we think. When people hear the Fed is printing money, they freak out. They think of Venezuela or Zimbabwe or the 1970s. My, my social media is full of these messages, fearing tremendous inflation. And this, this pushes up the price of gold, as we've seen. And is it a real concern? How much do you think inflation there is, is there right now? What's the inflation rate today? And as Jared pointed out, no matter how you measure it, and there are a bunch of different ways, the Fed generally hasn't hit its target of 2%, that's shown here by the red line. This year, inflation is way down. Despite $1.4 trillion in new base money, it's less than 1% right now. Where will that number be by the end of this year? Can you guess? Well, the Fed has a guess. The Fed itself projects this year will come in under 1%. And here on the Atlanta Fed's Economy Now app, I don't know if you can see this, there we go, uh, the consensus estimate is around 1.7%. I, I, keep, I keep the Economy Now app all, uh, going all the time. So there isn't much chance of runaway inflation, really. Remember, the target is 2%. They can hit that target if they want to. 
They can just increase the quantity of money and that will stimulate the economy to come back as soon as we're all able to get back to work. In fact, it would give people more incentive to find productive ways to work from home, but they don't plan on hitting that inflation target anytime soon. In other words, right now, money is too tight. This is not ideal. This makes any recovery harder. The Fed is in a difficult position because if they could actually raise inflation to say three or three and a half percent, which is where it should be right now to make up for months of low inflation, everybody would worry that it would go higher. It's hard to know because the Fed keeps everything secret until they surprise us with big announcements every quarter or so. Now the Fed understands, and Sarah mentioned this, the Fed understands that there is no trade-off between the economy and the virus. That's good. The Fed wants to do its part to stimulate the economy as best they can. That's also good. But they have a history of making shocks worse, not better. So I want to give the Fed a rule they can follow to automatically do the right thing without ever having any meetings or announcements. And it's called nominal GDP level targeting. It's created by Scott Sumner and some other market monetarists. I want to break it down because I think it's the single thing governments can do right now to help recover from the current shock as well as future shocks and prevent future recessions. First, what's nominal GDP? Well, it's just all the money that changes hands in the economy during the year without any adjustments or calculation because people pay the actual price for goods and services with inflation built in, not subtracted out. So, so think of nominal GDP as the cash register price of everything bought and sold and the actual amount on your paycheck. It's a true measure of aggregate demand. If the Fed were to target nominal GDP, there'd be no trade-off between inflation and growth because they're combined in the one number. So the Fed would just look at one number, nominal GDP, and if the Fed sets a target of say 4% nominal GDP growth by the end of the year, it doesn't matter what GDP or inflation are as long as they add up to 4%. Now, here's an example where GDP might be projected to come in at 3% and inflation at 1%. That's fine, that's on target. In another year like this one, you might have a lot less growth, so you would create more inflation by buying assets. Inflation increases the velocity of money. It makes money like a hot potato that people would rather spend now than hold and that helps stimulate the economy, especially during a demand shock. So this combination is also on target. Now later, growth might become, might increase, but inflation might be a bit too high. In that case, the Fed would sell assets, destroying enough money to bring inflation down to 1%, thereby hitting the target. The Fed shouldn't care what the individual numbers are, as long as the total is 4%. Now, level targeting means you promise to hit your target number and you do it. If you undershoot one year, you overshoot the next so that on average, nominal GDP comes in exactly on your target. Properly done, level targeting acts as a damper rather than a spring. Without level targeting, the Fed could drive up inflation, but people wouldn't know their intentions and markets wouldn't know what to expect next. With level targeting, there's no more guessing and markets are more efficient. The Fed could do this using a rule rather than by making decisions. They could make a daily adjustment to the money supply based on projected nominal GDP, which would result in a buy, sell, or hold and send a signal to markets every 24 hours. There would never be any committee decisions, announcements, or surprises. We're in a difficult situation right now, that's clear. Nominal GDP level targeting can't be keep people safe at work and it can't put people on airplanes, but it would do almost all the heavy lifting in recovering in the short term and the long term from a demand shock like we've seen. So I want to emphasize one thing, that even though we need 3% inflation now or we need more inflation, it would be a bad strategy for the Fed just to print enough money and deliver inflation. Instead, the Fed should declare their commitment to a level target for nominal GDP and adjust often enough to make that threat credible. To wrap up, will we have a V-shaped recovery? Well, no matter what happens next, nominal GDP level targeting is better than fiscal stimulus and it's better than our current policy. It would give us the inflation we need to bring interest rates back up and normalize 
our, econom our economy as soon as possible. As our currency goes digital, which I hope will be sooner than later, we'll be able to fully automate our monetary policy, write it into software, set it and forget it. That will give us the best chance for fewer recessions, long run economic growth and increased quality of life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Um, we, unfortunately, we, we've, uh, we, we've spent more time than I think we had planned, so we only have a few minutes for, for questions among us. Uh, my vote is for David to be the Fed chairman <laughs> and, uh, and take, take, uh, take control of this economy. <laughs> you know, the Fed has its dual role of, of dual role of both uh, stability in the currency and also growing the economy. The idea of putting those together as one role is uh, quite creative. And I, well, I'd love to, actually, I'll open the floor up to, to ask Sarah first what she thinks of that. <laughs> well, of course, with the with the automatic, you know, Siegel rule, we probably yeah. wouldn't be chairman, right? It would all be. Um, it would all you be wouldn't automatic. need one. Well, someone has <laughs> That's to. Someone, right. That's right. Turn the dials, right? Um, That's right. I'll, Actually, I'll that would, as, I'll, would, the committee I'll, I'll would decide that. whether you want four percent or four and a half percent or five percent. That's the target is what, and co with with Congress, that's what you would decide. That's it. it, it interesting thoughts. What do you think? I'll complain. Uh, I'll complain a little bit about um, nominal GDP targeting. Um, uh, just a little, because there, it has many attractive attributes, uh, particularly the level targeting part. Um, and by the way, I actually think that um, whether you're targeting the price level or the nominal GDP level, uh, there's maybe a, a less difference there than some people would imagine. And that as long as you're doing level targeting, you're doing something that has a memory. And that's what I like the best about it. Uh, what's bad is the idea that you uh, you know, get you achieve some goal, but you forget that you were way below that goal for a long time, so you don't make up the losses. So I really like the level aspect. Here's the thing that I would 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 punch back though on uh, David, which is at the end of the day, you have to remember, as I know you know, and we all know, that the Federal Reserve really can, at, at some level, has one really big bazooka, and that's the price of credit. And your theory and any other theory is um, dealing with tweaking the price of credit, dealing with uh, inflation and interest rates in order to try to achieve an economic goal. And there are times when the economy is uh, so fraught with uh, weakness that just targeting the interest rate is what Keynes called pushing on a string. That is, you can lower the interest rate all you want you can take it to zero and leave it there. You can even go negative and you're still not right. going to get the growth that you need. So the part of your rap that I didn't agree with was when you said something, we won't need fiscal stimulus. No, we'll always need fiscal stimulus at a time when the interest rate is around zero because the Fed can't do it alone. There has to be the one-two punch of monetary and fiscal working together. I'm yeah. ready, <laughs> I'm ready, but uh, can I make it short? Okay. Uh, I'm a monetarist from the school of Milton Friedman. We don't believe that the Fed should be in the interest rate business at all. Mm, we believe markets problem. should set interest and, and the Fed should only worry about the quantity of money and nominal GDP, and that's it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I take Sarah's point that, that, that so much is going on that's not coordinated well. And I think uh, it's very difficult in a time of crisis you know, for all these things to be you know, coordinated and be headed in the right direction. You know, it's an unprecedented amount of fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus and creative, actually very creative things the Fed is doing that are quite, you know, that are really impressive. So I, I want to ask this question because we really didn't sort of solve that. I think, I think Sarah described it as a very slow recovery. Where, where, where are we? Because you know, some of the numbers that, that I've seen, which surprised me, which is that you know housing starts and building permits and you know the retail sales are all almost at, at amazing levels in, in July and you know supposing I assume they're they're continuing through August. Uh, obviously there are uh, haves and have-nots. There's there's um, if you look at you know retail and 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 uh, travel and transportation and hotels and restaurants, 
it's a disaster. But but uh, yeah, I run a manufacturing business. I own a construction company. We can't find employees. Mm. Uh, so there's there's really almost like two economies. And I, I wonder if if you took all the the people that are affected by those now almost destroyed industries and obviously you've got to sort of redirect them and redirect that, that, that talent. Um, what, what, is, what does the other economy look like? It seems like it's very vibrant, oddly enough. I'll, I'll, I'll put that to Sarah. You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. So the, um, you know, so I think you're right, Richard, that there are sectors, there are, you know, sectors that are recovering faster than others. Um, I think it's early to say whether the recovery numbers that we're seeing in those sectors is sustainable or more transitory. So we haven't had enough time yet to assess um, the persistence of that, you know, of that growth. Um, so, you know, but I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you uh, paint a picture as if there's absolutely nothing um, going on or, or certainly nothing positive in, in the recovery. I think it's been very early. Um, and I, I, I still have to look at the unemployment numbers. I mean, I have to think about that gap between the number of people who are, um, who are out of work but want work and can't find it. And I think that that is a, a proxy for really the extent to which we do have momentum in this economy. And it's, yeah. you know, it's possible that that number will whittle it down, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a, you know, at a, at a nice pace with some kind of, you know, some kind of traction. I think it's too early to say um, at, at this point. And I, I, for one, don't see, um, I don't see, um, us turning the corner on the health care on the health crisis yet to such an extent that would make me feel positive on the economic side. I mean, we are still seeing uh, significant numbers of deaths per day and significant number of new infections a day. And as long as those numbers are still there, I find it hard to um, conceive of a of an economic recovery that is going to be equal among all. Yeah. Sectors. Well, let's <laughs> if nothing else else keeping people from being on airplanes. So I think there are certain, you know, hotels, restaurants, aircraft, air, airplanes, and, and transportation. Uh, they may not recover very quickly. And, you know, I mean, United Airlines is talking about still letting go of half their staff. So I, I think we're at the beginning of, of, of some problems and, and we're, we're, you know, it's a relocate, it's a dislocation that, that may really continue to get worse. But let I, me like ask, let me ask one more I do like your idea though that, about redeployment. I think that's really interesting. You know, the idea about actually taking uh, you know taking people who are unemployed, who are in industries where, you know, that are not coming back yeah. anytime soon and figuring out a way to take that human talent and deploy it in uh, you know in an area where jobs are growing and where demand is going to be high. Yeah, I agree with you. Let me, let me ask a question. I'm sure the, the audience is probably, uh, they may ask it themselves, but how do we handle all this debt we keep creating? It's, it's a topic that's come up in our, our previous financial presentations. We just keep getting more and more debt. We're presuming that the Chinese are going to buy all this debt or someone else. Uh, how sustainable is this? Jared? Um. I think it's more sustainable than most people think. Um, and the reason is because interest rates are so low and they're expected to stay so low for so long. If you look at the debt as a share of the economy, uh, your question is absolutely well-founded. We will soon pass the historic high for that value, which was 106% in, I believe, 1946. Well, it turns out that whether you're fighting fascists or whether you're fighting microbes, it's expensive. And uh, I think that these uh, expenses must be met. The idea of austere fiscal policy at a time when you're facing an existential crisis, I suspect none of us would agree is a good idea. Uh, but we, uh, we have um, uh, an ally in this regard, and I complained about this uh, very low interest rates as a weakness uh, in, in talking about some of the underlying um, uh, 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 structural demand problems. Uh, but in this case, 
it's a it's it's an attribute because while uh, the, the projections are for debt to GDP to go to historically high levels, the predictions of uh, servicing that debt are quite low. They're right there in the historical average, if not lower. So in that sense, I think it uh, is sustainable. Um, in fact, uh, the key thing to think about here is that as long as your growth rate is faster than your interest rate, uh, your uh, yeah, servicing your debt is going to be uh, far less of a lift or a challenge than you than you might think. Now we're not looking at particularly strong secular growth growth rates going forward, but they uh, 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 I'm I'm quite certain they'll surpass the very low interest rates I expect. Now that said, this is a risky strategy because if you're carrying that much debt and there's an unforeseen spike in the interest rate, boy, you've got a problem on your hands. But that's my outlook. I agree with you. I think it'd also be nice to pay back the debt with inflated dollars. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. I don't think we're so, going to either. Yeah. Right. I'm going to turn it back to Chris. That was Richard, I'm going, to let you, I'm going to let you go ahead and, and continue with the panel. We only have a couple of questions, and I think we'd love to hear a little bit more from everybody. It's very interesting. Okay. Uh, is the, the question that, that actually is perhaps implied in the opposite direction, is inflation uh, inevitable? I mean, how do, you, how do you print all this, this debt? How do you have fiscal expenses and, and, and spending going on? Um, social programs that have to be and should be funded. Um, how does inflation, what, what's going on? Why, why isn't inflation happening? Who wants that, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I, you know, I actually, I think I thought Jared um, explained it, uh, you know, very, very well. But and, and David too mentioned how even you know pre-pandemic the Fed was having a very hard time hitting the two percent, you know, the informal two percent inflation target. Um, so even pre-pandemic there was this, um, you know. This this refutation of you know of, of of the idea of the Phillips curve with the you know with the trade off between unemployment um, and inflation because of course we were achieving uh, very low unemployment rates and not seeing an emergence or reemergence of um, of inflation uh, so there is something going on uh, that is that has has messed up the usual expectations regarding um, when does inflation reemerge and now with the pandemic and all the spending that has um, occurred, you know, people are, are, are asking, you know, well, how can all of this money uh, be sloshing around and yet we still um, see these inflation numbers getting nowhere near um, even this 2% 2 target. So something is afoot, uh, something was afoot. Um, and I would, only, I would only add that there is a notion to inflation uh, that, that goes to this idea of expectations, of inflationary expectations, which, it, which becomes a almost psychological concept of people um, themselves losing faith uh, that a central bank, for example, can, uh, can keep uh, inflation uh, under wraps. And, uh, you know, there is always the possibility that, that inflationary expectations become unhinged at some point. Um, it's very noteworthy, however, that we didn't see that um, after you know, significant stimulus after the, after the financial crisis, and we are not uh, seeing it now. And which isn't to say that we will never, ever, ever see it, but um, uh, that relationship, I think, has, has, has been broken um, and has been broken for a while. So do you think we can get away with never having a balanced budget, at least in the foreseeable future, and the, the world keeps buying our bonds? We'll give that to David. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think we should keep doubling the deficit forever. I think that's every eight years the deficit doubles, right? Uh, uh, the debt, the national debt doubles every eight years for the last six uh last 24 years so that's that's not a good trend uh and so i think it's important to pay attention to our house and how we spend money in in the fiscal domain and i'm i'm not a believer in mmt at all and i'm not a big believer in austerity but in the middle i think we have careful 
productive, useful spending of money on the fiscal side, and then simply commit to nominal GDP level targeting. If, if, you, if you run up uh, a, a certain amount of inflation and then it's, you, it's too high, you just sell the assets. People don't really get this. They can just unwind the trades and bring inflation back down. Uh, and so by doing exactly what Jared said, which I believe has a lot to do with innovation, uh, we, we can continue to pay our debt and I'm, and I'm not particularly worried about it. Oh, interesting. Well, I agree with Jared in the, the Fed, having been um, you know, on the Fed, uh, doesn't have the magic tools to affect the economy. In fact, it lacks tools generally, and, and a lot of it's psychological. Uh, you know, I was on the Greenspan Fed, and uh, if, if, if Alan's briefcase was pointed one way, it meant one thing. If it was pointed the other way, you know, the, the world worried, and, and we, we, we worried so much about quarter point changes in the overnight you know, discount rate. The total borrowings from banks was about $200 million. You know, it was, it was an absurdity. Um, so obviously that's changed, but um, so much of it is psychological. And uh, I don't know that the Fed, uh, if it's off course, I can necessarily correct it. You know, changing interest rates, um, at least you know, between, you know, for bank lending, is, is only so, so much in terms of its effectiveness. So it's, uh, I mean, the only thing I'd want to add about inflation, um, you know, I, I kind of, whenever you have this discussion, uh, this is a question, you know, what, why is inflation so intractably low? I've heard discussed in many forums. And pretty much what everybody says is some version of restating the question and scratching your head. Um, yeah. uh, and, and so I have to think that, you know, there's a lot we don't, don't probably know, although I, I want to underscore Sarah's expectations point. I'm sure that's uh, in the mix. But the way I look at it is somewhat old school, which is that if inflation is, is, is very, is persistently low, that's another way of saying that there's capacity in the economy, that there's slack, that there's yeah. room for more economic activity. And if the uh, private sector isn't stepping up to the mat and doing that, well, we have a public sector that, as we've said, can borrow at very low rates, and we have tremendous needs in terms of our public infrastructure, as Sarah was articulating, uh, especially around the area of clean energy, but not just in that, in education and child care and old-fashioned infrastructure, roads and bridges. Uh, and, uh, and so as in, in low inflation is maybe a puzzle, I grant you, but it's also uh, our friend in the sense that it, it, it's telling us there's more capacity and darn it, we should take advantage of that. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I, I, yeah, I was David so wants to, David, did you have a, a thought on yeah. that? Yeah, yes, I believe that's, that's a very prevalent Keynesian view, and as Milton Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, and, and those two really aren't as linked as too many people think. So Sarah, you, you were in the Treasury Department at, at one time in your life. Um, are you impressed with, with the payroll protection plan and, and, the, you know, and the, 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 the ability of, of I guess, the uh, the treasury and 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 and, the, and credit the administration of, of getting money in the hands of, of companies and small businesses and you know twelve hundred hour checks to people and I mean I I, I must admit I, I was impressed that 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 works because the, you know anyone that's ever done business with the SBA would know that that's a disaster so the fact that that actually uh, ultimately I think it's amazing how many loans and and, and how many companies were propped up and um, what do you think? Yeah, no, it's a great, a great question. And I, I have to say that I was um, initially very optimistic uh, when I saw that the launch of the, of the Paycheck Protection Program. I liked that it was targeted to small business. I thought that was smart. And I liked how it, it would, you know, it would move from being a, um, um, from a loan to a grant if you met certain employment targets. I liked that idea, and this is again what fiscal policy is good at doing when it does it well, which is really targeting, you know, sort of keeping our eyes on the prize here, which is can we get money into the hands of small businesses before those small business owners have to lay people off? And I thought that was 
in the design of the payment protection program. I liked, you know, how it, you know, again, converted from a, from a, a, from a loan to a grant if you met those employment targets. So in theory- It, it wasn't perfect, design, it wasn't perfect, but, it, but ultimately but, we're- but, Well, I don't know though. So here, you know, Richard, we probably don't have enough time to, 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 to get into it. I thought it was bumpy. I thought it was a bumpy implementation. I mm -hmm. thought that the SBA, you know, should not have been the, uh, the part of the federal government to, be the the implementer of it i thought you know treasury could have done that better i only you know i'm working off a notion of you know th those sba i happen to know those sba websites would go down for like you know 30 minutes a day in good times and i used to think like you know in good times if they're doing that how in the world are they going to deal with the onslaught of demand you know during the pandemic so i thought I, I differ with your assessment somewhat i don't i i thought it was rocky and i also thought that the um you know the the role of the banks in being the intermediaries um on those plans turned out to um you know some banks were you know understood what the rules were others didn't a lot of small businesses, by the way, don't even have relationships with banks. So using yeah. the bank as the intermediary turned out to, in some cases, not be the best vehicle. And well, but, you know, David will but, but would probably realize there, you know, there were a lot of you know sort of platforms that wanted to be those intermediaries instead of instead of banks. Yeah. So, well, um, I, I, so I was a little, you know, I, 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 I don't thought think it was good designed. It could have been in hindsight, it could have been done better for sure, but. Ultimately, got a lot of money out quickly, and it was it was tough. It was tough as a consumer, you know. I, I you know, it's, if you don't have a banking relationship, they didn't. The banks talk to you, and and then it was it turned out the community banks did, did the share of the lending, and the big banks were just falling. They just didn't know how to do it. So it was it was. There's a lot of things we can spell out on that, but it was. I thought it was interesting. Um, the, the whole Main Street lending program, which is you know Fed. Fed sponsored through special purpose vehicles is that hasn't really happened, and I don't know why. It's another, you know, it's a, it's something I wanted to ask David about. But I think, I think with Chris's picture coming back on, I'm, I'm getting the the nod that we should uh, we should try and wrap up. Yes, unfortunately we're out of time, and I apologize to the few people who did write in questions. I think uh, most of those questions are, are, are experts uh, at least talked about them in some level. And we knew when we tackled this topic that this could have been a three hour program, but we know that an hour is good. We extended it to an hour and 15. So it gives us an opportunity to revisit this because it's changing every day. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for your participation. I wanna thank our audience, remind you to please continue to read our emails and hopefully join us next week for our next program. Richard, anything you wanna to say to close this out? I'd like to invite our panelists to come to Vail when, as soon as the if the world goes back to normal, and we can, uh, if they'll agree to that, we can do this again uh, after the election and probably uh, into the spring if, if we're lucky. So I thank you very much. It's been uh, great to, uh, to host this and, and be involved, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And you were a, a great, the three of you uh, really brought different perspectives that made it very interesting. And of course, as I said, we could go on for quite a long time, so we will revisit it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a good night, and we'll see you soon. Cheers.